Okay, hello everyone, welcome back. I uh, hope you had a good break. So now we have a talk by Tony Annala from, the, from UBC, who's going to talk us about derived algebraic cobordism towards bivariant Connor Floyd theorem. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, I hope you can all hear me fine. Uh, okay, and thanks for the organizers for giving me this opportunity to speak here. Uh, so yeah, uh, Dennis already told the title. So what's going to happen today? Uh, I'm just going to first quickly recall classical algebraic bordism, some de its definition and results about it. And I'm going to introduce a derived algebraic bordism which generalizes it. And I'm going to recall, recall some known results uh, very quickly. Uh, probably won't. I have to sort of skim through them because <laughs> I have too many goals. I'm going to give examples of open questions, uh, so what is not known yet. And then I'm going to focus on one in particular, this bivariant Connor Floyd theorem that already appeared in the title. OK, so yeah. So what is this uh, classical algebraic bordism? So it was defined by Levin Morel. Uh, our setup is, so K is a field of characteristic zero and all schemes are quasi-projective over K. You can weaken this a little bit, but you cannot get rid of characteristic zero assumptions, for example. And so we're gonna use a uh, definition by Levin and Panbury Pande, which is uh, simpler than the original one by Levin and Morel. Okay, I mean, it, it, so if, it's, if you have seen, say, Chow groups, then you're gonna be fine, uh, or if you have seen Cobordism, then you should also be fine. So algebraic bordism is a graded abelian group or algebraic bordism of X. Uh, and its generators are just symbols, V to X, where this is like a symbol on uh, isomorphism class of, uh, of a smooth I-dimensional variety V. So this is smooth I-dimensional and the map is project, projective. Okay, and yeah, so, so this is the great I these generators, so its degree is given just by uh, dimension. And then, so these are the generators, but what are the relations? They are so called double point cobordism relations. So, what are they? Uh, let's just uh, quickly read some things. I'm going to show you a picture in the next slide. But so, you, you start with something mapping to T1 cross X sort of an uh, algebraic version of cobordism. Uh, w has to be a smooth of dimension i plus one, so that fibers should be i-dimensional. Uh, it should surject to p1, otherwise everything will die. Uh, fiber over zero is smooth. Fiber over infinity is the sum of two smooth devices meeting in, uh, transversally. And then we have this kind of relation. So let's see a picture. Uh, so as I told you, so this is W, it maps to T1 cross X. Uh, the fiber over zero is smooth. The fiber over infinity splits as sum of two uh, divisors, divisors in, in W. Uh, these we assume intersect transversally. And then we have this relation that W to X is the same as A to X plus B to X minus a projective bundle, a P1 bundle on the intersection. So this, this uh, might look a little bit scary, this projective bundle, but uh, it, it's okay. Uh, it doesn't depend on the order of A and B, uh, as was told by Pavel in the last, uh, last iteration, I think. Okay, so I hope uh, this is somehow a reasonable analog of cobordism in, in algebraic geometry. Uh, there's a special case called the naive cobordism, which is, I guess, four straight lower forward uh, analog of cobordism, where we just assume that the fiber over infinity is already smooth. So we can take A is the whole fiber and B is empty, and then the double point relation we had our last in our last slide just reduces to this that W, that the fiber over zero is the fiber over infinity, okay? Yeah. 
And it, it, apparently it can be shown that you cannot just enforce these relations and hope to get something good. So you have to face these more complicated relations. Okay. So functorially, this is very similar to Chow groups. So it's, it's gives some sort of homology theory of, or borel more homology theory. So every time we have a projective map or a proper map of projective schemes, what a projective scheme, uh, <coughs> then we get a push forward morphism, which is done by just composing. So we have V to X and this is just V to X and then compose with F to Y. Okay, so it's even easier than a push forward in uh, Chow group. Uh, if we have a smooth morphism, then it's very easy to define a full map. Because uh, if a V maps to Y and V is smooth, then if we pull back V on a smooth morphism, then this pullback is also smooth. So this is a good cycle. Okay. Uh, and, and more generally, if, uh, if we have an LCI morphism, so what is an LCI morphism? It's for us here, it's just a composition of a regular embedding and then a smooth map. And whenever, whenever we have such a morphism, we have an LCI pullback. And if you know the uh, construction for, for child groups, it's basically the same construction. So you have to use deformation of the normal cone and, and stuff like that. Uh, was there a question? Okay, um, okay, so, so this last operation doesn't have a nice formula in general. Uh, in good cases, it's just given by the fiber product, but if the cycle doesn't meet transversally, it's, it's not gonna work. Okay, uh, some, some other properties. So, so if you look at the algebraic dualism of the ground field K or the spectrum of that one, it's a ring. Oh, uh, the addition, I haven't put it here, but the addition is just disjoint union of cycles. So that, that should make sense. And then the multiplication for, for this very special ring, it's just given by uh, product. So really this is the fiber product over spec K, but let's denote it like this because we assume the ground field to be fixed. Uh, okay. Moreover, for all x, this has a uh, the algebraic polarism of x is the module over this ring of the point, and again, it's very easy to define what is the what is the ring or or the module action. So you just again take products. Okay. Uh, yeah. For the final uh, basic property, we need to somehow uh, recall the theory of churn classes in, in algebraic polarism. So every time we have a line bundle L over X, we can define the churn operator using the zero section of the line bundle, which is this S. Now this is a closed embedding and an LCI morphism. So we can push forward and pull back. And in fact, we define the churn class operator as the composition of those two operators. And you can check that this actually drops the degree by one. Uh, in, in good cases, you're basically intersecting with a smooth section. So you can smooth section of the, of the line bundle. So, yeah. And then one, one very big difference with Chow groups is that the first churn class of, of the tensor product is not just the sum of the churn classes, but you have these extra terms here. And these AIJs are in the ring or the algebraic person group of the point. They do not depend on these line bundles nor on X. So they're fixed. It work, works for all this kind of tensor product. Uh, every time you have two on, on, on any X. Uh, and then basic properties of, of the tensor product of line bundles just show you that 
this two-term power series should be a formal group law. So I'm not going to define what is a formal group law, but it's basically you, you assume this to be somehow associative, commutative, and then zero. If you put zero in place of, say, C1, L1, then you should get just the C1, L2, which is clearly two, true. Okay. And every time you have a ring with a formal group law, you get a morphism from the Lassac ring to your ring. Okay. So this formal group law gives a morphism like this. And it's a, uh, it's a theorem of Levin and Morel that this is an isomorphism. So again, I'm not going to define what is Lassac ring, uh, but its structure is pretty much uh, known up to isomorphism. Isomorphisms, I guess, are more, more hard. But this is really the computation of algebraic cobordism of a point. Okay. And if you know uh, complex cobordism, then this is basically analog of, of the famous computation of Quillen. Or maybe it's not by Quillen. Uh, I guess it's uh, by some other people. Uh, OK, but there's an analog of this in, in topology. Or rather, this is an analog of a result in topology. OK. Uh, yeah. Then this morphism to the, to the ground ring from the Lassard ring is or identification with the Lassard ring of the Bordesen group of, of, of the point is used to get sort of connections of this theory with some other theory. So for example, if we denote by ZK the integers with this formal group law, then uh, you get, if you take the tensor product of uh, G, ZA with uh, the covordism or the bordism of FX, you recover the child group. And the morphism is sort of the trivial one that you, you could define. So this is not so important maybe for this talk. Uh, and if you take the integers with another formal group law, so you, every time you change the formal group law, you change the L algebra, algebra structure. So this Zn is not the same L algebra as Za, only as an abstract uh, thing. But if you do this tensor product, then you recover the K theory of Grothendieck or the Grothendieck group of, uh, of coherent sheets. And here the morphism is just take the derived push forward of the structure sheet. Or rather, well, you have to take the cohomology and then take an alternating sum. And, and this is what uh, at least I call Connor Floyd. I hope it's a standard. Maybe, maybe it's not. Okay. Uh, there are some other properties that are not so important for this talk. I'm not going to spend much time on them. Uh, if you have some experience with, say, Chow groups or K theory or something like this, then you know that these kind of theorems are nice for computations and for sorry, and stuff like that. And they also hold for this algebraic, algebraic bordism of Levin and Morel. OK, so I've defined algebraic bordism. But what is algebraic cobordism classically? Well, much like uh, Chow groups are rings for smooth schemes, uh, if we have a smooth variety over K, field of characteristic zero, then uh, also algebraic bordism is a ring. Uh, and then we define it as doing this kind of a, a four-mode degree shift. We, we just shift our grading convention to be sort of cohomological, sorry, co-dimensional instead of dimensional. Uh, so sorry, Tony, here, yeah. don't you need X also to be proper? Uh, no. I mean, if you get ring structure, you only need... No, no, not for the ring structure, for this dual Concrete duality kind of definition. No, no, oh, no, no but it's Borel Moore. It's, it's Borel Moore, yeah. That's, that's the thing that saves us, sort of. Yeah. Okay, so this has a ring structure by intersection product. So you basically construct the same way as the product for Chow, Chow rings. 
you're just using the fact that the diagonal morphism of a smooth variety is an LCI morphism. It's a regular entity. Okay. And give some multiplicative cohomology theory. So what do I need here? Well, an arbitrary morphism between smooth schemes is LCI. So you have an LCI pullback. And this pullback morphism respects multiplication, respects this intersection theorem. And moreover, these two isomorphisms of these sort of important theories uh, are then isomorphisms of rings. So we are sort of enhancing, enhancing them. Yeah. Uh, yeah. By the way, can you see my mouse when, when I move it? Yes, it's fine. Oh, that's, that's great, uh, because I was planning to sort of point to different places with the mouse, and uh, it would have been very unfortunate if, if that didn't work. OK, so now I have sort of recalled the, quickly recalled the classical story. So this was sort of the background for my research. And uh, yeah, in fact, when I first went to Vancouver in August uh, 2017, and I met with my advisor, uh, this is basically what he told me in the first meeting, I, I, I suppose. Okay, but now I'm gonna explain what on earth is the right algebraic cohortism. Uh, yeah, but before this, I'll sort of give you a crash course of uh, in derived algebraic geometry, which is uh, one slide long. So it's not quite as complete as Lurie's work, but we'll do it here. So affine derived schemes are just the sort of spectra of simplicial commutative rings. So if you don't know what a simplicial commutative ring is, then you can think of it as a topological ring, sort of topological commutative ring almost. Uh, you obtain the right scheme by gluing affine derived schemes of the coherent homotopy, uh, because everything is sort of uh, considered not quite up to homotopy equivalence, but in a more sophisticated way. Okay. Uh, Quasi-smooth morphism is the derived analog of LCI morphism. And the main thing that makes them better than LCI morphisms, and the main reason I have to use the right algebraic geometry is that quasi-smooth morphisms are stable under the right phase change, unlike LCI morphisms, which are not uh, stable under just the normal base change of, of scheme. So in fact, you can, basically any closed embedding is, uh, is classical pullback of a regular embedding. You, you have to make some assumptions, say of projective schemes. Okay, so the definition I'm gonna use for the right algebraic cobordism is what I call universal free cobordism because it might not have all the relations, but uh, it's this theory, even though we might later need to add some more relations to it, it already satisfies many good properties. So, and, and of course these properties are gonna hold if we, impose more relations. So our setup is more general than before. Instead of the ground ring being a field of characteristic zero, it's uh, an Arthurian and of finite cool dimension. So I guess the most important uh, or most interesting case would be a field not of characteristic zero or maybe the integers or something like this. And we are also going to assume that all the right schemes are quasi-projective over A. So being quasi-projective is basically the same for the right schemes as for, for you know, the classical schemes. Okay. And then, so the definition is in my paper with uh, Sergio Yakura. Uh, so, okay, so it's going to look pretty similar to the previous one. So again, a graded ring, a graded proof. Uh, we have upper star and we're going to use somehow co-dimensional grading. Uh, so the degree I group or part is generated by symbols. Again, V maps to X. Uh, what are these? 
they are equivalence classes. Well, you have to replace isomorphism class with equivalence class because you need to live in an infinity category also. Uh, okay, there are equivalence classes of projective and quasi smooth morphisms of relative virtual dimension minus i. So, virtual co dimension almost, right? Yeah, virtual co dimension i almost. Okay, and um, we take this modulo at the right version of the double point coordinate. So one, one note I want to talk here is that it might look a, a bit different, and it indeed is. Uh, before we said that V itself should be smooth. Now we don't have condition explicitly on V, but we are just saying that the morphism should be quasi smooth. So what's up with this? Well, uh, it's the difference basically between a cohomology theory and a homology theory. So if we replace this condition with uh, saying that V should be quasi smooth and of virtual dimension something, then you basically get uh, the right version of the Bordison theory. Okay. Okay, so let's now explain the derived double point relations. Uh, it, it's basically again the same, except now you don't have to assume quite so many things. So W looks to P1 cross X, uh, the fiber over infinity is the uh, sum of two virtual Cartier divisors. Uh, virtual Cartier divisor is just a derived analog or derived version of a Cartier divisor. Uh, and then you have this relation. You don't have to assume that W rejects onto P1 or that these A and B intersect, intersect transversally or anything like this. You just want them to sort of split up in this way in the fiber over infinity. Okay, and, and we also have almost the same picture, except now uh, everything is sort of evil. Uh, so uh, as you can see, uh, so we assume that this map here is quasi-smooth and of relative virtual dimension minus i. And then we're just saying that, okay, then, then another assumption was that we have A and we have B, and these are virtual Cartier divisors in W, and their sum is the fiber over infinity. And then we can reinforce this relation and this these are all the relations we have in, in the uh, universal pre cohortism Okay. And as you can see, this is almost the same as the one before, except that we, instead of having just intersection, we take the homotopy intersection or the derived intersection. And this is basically the reason we don't have to assume any transversality here, uh, because in the right geometry, everything just works. Okay, so what are some, some basic properties? So now all of these groups are actually commutative graded rings. And this is completely obvious if you know the right algebra geometry, that is. Uh, and the ring structure is just given by the derived fiber product or homotopy fiber product, if you like. Okay. Uh, for an arbitrary morphism, you get a pull induced pullback again, just by taking fiber products. Okay, so this is somehow more cohomological theory. You have instead of having just pullbacks along just uh, quasi smooth morphisms, sorry, of uh, yeah, along just quasi smooth or just along LCI, now you have all pullbacks. Uh, and okay. But now, because this is cohomology theory, you're not supposed to be able to push forward quite so much. And indeed, only if you have a projective and a quasi-smooth morphism, you can push forward. And the definition of this push forward is trivial because uh, both of these pro properties, being projective and being quasi-smooth, are closed under compositions. So you can define the push forward like this, using composition. Okay. 
fair enough. Uh, yeah, so with this definition, you can actually prove a version of Connor Floyd. So like in the classical case, we do have churn classes of line bundles. Uh, actually, we do have churn classes of, uh, of all vector bundles. Uh, but for this, we only need the, for the line bundles. And again, the churn classes satisfy a formal group law when you take tensor product of line bundles, giving us a morphism from the Lazar tree. OK, but now I'm not claiming that this is an isomorphism. And in fact, I don't know as well. I haven't proven it in a single case that it should be an isomorphism. But we have a morphism, at least. OK. And then we have the following theorem. Uh, there is a natural isomorphism from this universal Rico-Bordesen tensored with uh, the sort of multiplicative integers. And this is isomorphic to the growth and decreeing of vector bundles on X. So let's just recall that the M is integers and the L algebra structure is given by the formal group law X plus Y minus X times Y. Okay. And the morphism, again, it's trivial. It's the only, only thing to, you could do. So given a cycle, you just send it to the push forward of the, of the coherent, sorry, of the structure sheet. Uh, okay, so this is going to be a perfect complex. So you can either just consider the K theory of perfect complexes or break this up uh, into a complex of uh, vector bundles. And, and note that this is comparable with the classical result of uh, Levin and Morel. So the Connor Floyd I mentioned previously, only if uh, A is a field of characteristic zero and if X is smooth. Otherwise, uh, if it, uh, K doesn't have, say, characteristic zero, then we don't know how to define algebraic cobordison or algebraic cobordison, unless maybe you want to use something coming from Motivic homotopy theory. Okay. Uh, and if X is, um, if A is a field of characteristic zero and X is not smooth, then we actually don't have this cohomology theory. We only have the homology theory, and it doesn't give you something isomorphic to to growth and decreeing of vector bundles up there. This tensor product it gives you, as as I already told, the G theory of coherent sheets. Okay. Uh, this also shows that uh, this universal precobordism is not homotopy invariant. Uh, I think it was Christian mentioned in the last talk that K theory is not homotopy invariant for smooth, uh, sorry, for similar schemes. So, because you can recover it from, from this universal precobordism, also this cannot be homotopy invariant. So, in particular, it cannot come from motivic homotopy theory. Uh, um, sorry, may I ask a question? So this sure. previous, previous theorem that just disappeared, your oh, your Connor Floyd is so X is any anything over oh, yeah. any base. So X is quasi projective derived scheme over this uh, base ring A. Uh -huh. So you don't need to assume any smoothness or anything. The, and and the assumptions on the base ring are the theory of finite co-dimensions. So it's, it's quite general. I see, thank you. Okay. Uh, yeah, this is not gonna be so important for the talk, uh, but if you know growth and degree and rock, then I can sort of define a pre chow ring just using, the, using this tensor product, and then I have a version of uh, growth and decrease and rock. Okay, and it has many nice, nice properties. Uh, yeah, this is not so important. Uh, also, projective bundle formula holds. Uh, also, this is not super important for this talk, uh, but this followed from 
work of me and Sachi Yakura, and then later some more work by me, that you basically know the cobalt pre universal pre cobalt assembling of a projective bundle. If you know the universal pre cobalt assembling of, of, X, of the base space. Okay. So I guess these are sort of nice results. Uh, as I told you, I'm, I'm also going to give you some open questions. So I've been fairly quick. I hope I haven't lost everyone. I cannot see anyone's face, so <laughs> it's hard to tell if everyone is sort of shutting down already. But OK, so open questions. So the first one is actually a little bit embarrassing, uh, maybe. Hold on, sorry. Before you go to open questions, there's been a question in the chat that I think okay. is good, perhaps a good moment to ask it. Sure. Uh, so the question is, do you obtain churn classes for x singular notion of churn yes classes. i do uh, otherwise i couldn't uh, prove this kind of uh, re wait where is the result i'm actually not sure which way i'm going yeah i mean so so this result holds also for similar things and it is in very important that we have churn classes even for similar schemes or to like schemes. Okay, did that answer the question? Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, okay, so now more open questions, uh, but by me. Uh, okay, so the first one, as I told you, is sort of uh, embarrassing maybe. So we have this natural morphism to, to the universal pre ring of the base ring. Uh, is it an isomorphism for, say, A is a field, or a local ring, or a principal ideal domain, or something like this? So what I'm basically saying that I haven't computed uh, this, the group structure on this on a single example because this one is basically the easiest case. Okay. Uh, yeah, so it, basically this is about classifying all projective quasi-smooth schemes up to this weird uh, cobordism relation. And the answer should be just the Lassard ring, at least when the crowd field is a ring or a local, sorry, if the ground ring is a field or a local ring or a PID. I and mean, it's just, an, just analogously to like, uh, say, K theory. Uh, the second one, uh, oh yeah, you can sort of show that it's always an injection at least. Uh, the second one, the second question, uh, Okay, so, so this universal picobordism has a natural extension to a bivariant theory. So what is a bivariant theory? I'm not gonna state all the axioms uh, in this talk because <laughs> that would be the talk. Uh, but a bivariant theory associates a group to a morphism. So instead of getting a group for any derived scheme, you get a group for a morphism of derived scheme. And now this ring that I previously had uh, is actually the special case where we take the identity morphism, okay? And then there's a bunch of operations on the bivariant theory, like the bivariant product, which reduce to the product that I already mentioned in this, in this special case. Okay, uh, that's not super important, but uh, the question that's actually important for this talk is that, is there a bivariant version of Connor Floyd? So we still have this Lazard, we can still do this tensor ring with VM over the Lazard ring. And then we can ask whether or not this thing is equivalent to the uh, bivariant algebraic K theory or the zero, zero part of that uh, defined by Fulton and Max version. Okay. Uh, 
Yeah, so I'm gonna talk more about more about this uh, later. Uh, then a third question is: uh, Is this Ricobordeson ring homotopy invariant for, say, uh, smooth schemes or a regular base or or something like this? And yeah, it would follow. Yeah, what, one way of proving it would be just to sort of use projective bundle formula and then if you can prove some sort of extension of cycles, then, then you can basically prove something like this. Uh, there are some more open questions, so let's go through them quickly. What about localization? Uh, so if you saw the previous talk uh, by Christian Dorhausen, then there was this kind of sequences and we can we may ask something similar for algebraic covordism or universal covordism uh, yeah but it's not clear what what this group should be and how to prove this kind of result and okay a note that this cannot be an, uh, a surjection in general because again we can just tensor with zm and recover k theory and for K theory, you might have negative proofs. So you don't expect this to be um, a surjection. Okay. And so the final one is about higher algebraic cobordism. Uh, so, so this is somehow the part that corresponds to, say, K0. And then there should be another grading that sort of recovers maybe the higher. K groups uh, in the same way. And one possible way to proceed is to maybe try to represent this kind of thing in some motivic homotopy theory without a one invariance. So I really don't know much about that, but maybe that would work, maybe not. Okay. Yeah, so, okay, that was fairly quick. Uh, I hope you got at least some idea what is to write, to write algebraic cobordism. I'm gonna soon give you another variant of the definition. But so next we're gonna focus on the actual open problem we're interested in to this talk, which is the bivariant version of Connor Floyd. Okay. Uh, yeah. So this is, this is not joint work with Adil Khan, although we did work on the same problem when I was visiting in Regensburg uh, this spring, early spring. But the, we did use uh, a different approach and it failed, unfortunately. And later when I was visiting uh, Mark Levin in, in Essen, uh, we had some discussions that actually were not related to this problem at all. And I realized that there is an, another approach. And I tried that and well, it also sort of failed, uh, but at least I was able to make some partial progress, which I'm gonna state here. Okay. Uh, yeah, but first motivation, uh, what is so interesting about bivariant corner Floyd? Well, if you consider the morphism to point, uh, okay, say the, ground ring is a field, then this point is uh, just the spectrum of, of the ground field. And then every and then a bivariant version of Connor Floyd with this morphism would give just some sort of a homological version. So this is like uh, the derived version of Levin Morel algebra cobordism. Sorry, can I interrupt you here? Sure. Uh, so you say this this omega lower star is supposed to be Borel Moore homology, right? Yes. So I think the right hand side should have like G theorem instead. Yes, that's true. Uh, maybe this is a bad notation, but I G theory for me is K lower star, <laughs> and K theory is sorry K lower node and and K theory is K upper node. So I maybe see. this is confusing. <laughs> a tiny bit. Uh, okay, I, I'm sorry, I'm just used to this notation. Uh, maybe I should have used something else. It's actually getting quite hot here. Uh, okay. Yeah, homological version of Connor Floyd. However, this is not going to be true. Uh, 
uh, and it's related to the fact that we are that we are dealing with universal cobordism instead of algebraic cobordism. So actually, I'm, I'm claiming that we do need to add more relations to universal cobordism to get algebraic cobordism. This is sort of the real deal. No longer cobordism. This is the right thing to right thing to do. Okay. And then being able to prove a bivariant version of Connor Floyd, I consider it to be a good indicator that we have succeeded in defining a bivariant version of algebraic cobordism. Okay. Uh, there's another reason, of course, that this is easier than the other ones. Uh, it's much easier to understand vector bundles on, on the right scheme than, for example, trying to find quasi-smooth compactifications of quasi-smooth schemes or classifying all projective quasi-smooth schemes up to this cobordism relation. Uh, at least here, I, I have some sort of uh, approach in mind how to do this. So, so maybe this is somehow the main reason. And, and this previous one is the sort of secondary, maybe. OK. So let's define the first main player in the bivariant Connor Floyd. Uh, we are only using one special case because it's slightly easier, uh, not so much for algebraic cobordism, but for the uh, bi bivariant K theory. OK, so this is again from the same paper by me and Yakura. Well, there is actually only one definition. So, so I'm just stating some special cases of it uh, as we move along. Uh, yeah. So x to y is a closed embedding, not an arbitrary morphism. Uh, you can always reduce to this case because everything is quasi-projective and because of some things that I'm not going to talk about. Uh, then we can define the graded group, which is the bivariant algebraic or the bivariant universal cobordism of this closed embedding. And again, it's a graded group, and the graded, uh, the degree i part is generated by symbols v mapping to x. It looks the same, it's almost the same. So these are equivalence classes of projective morphisms to x. So this morphism is projective, and we are not yet assuming anything about quasi smoothness. Okay. Such that the composition v to y, so v maps to x, maps to y, is quasi-smooth of relative dimension minus i. So you should really think that uh, these cycles are v projective over x, quasi-smooth over y. OK. And then the relation is the same, uh, or basically the same. It's like the bivariant analog of uh, the right double point cobordal simulation. Uh, again, basically the same story. This is probably even just copied from before. Maybe I make some uh, different things here. But so what is the picture here? We assume that this first morphism here is projective. This composition from W to P1 cross I is uh, this one should be quasi smooth and of relative dimension uh, minus i, so relative virtual dimension. And then we're just going to, and, and every time we have this, then we say that in the bivariant group, w to x uh, is the same as a to x, b to x, minus this projective bundle on this P1 bundle on the divide intersection. And it's, it's sort of trivial to check that these are actually cycles in this bivariant group. OK. And this is the definition of, of a bivariant universal cobordism. Uh, so it's basically the same definition a third time today. Uh, OK. But now I claim that I have some idea what should the extra relations be. Uh, I'm going to take them from the work of Lovry and Shirk, who were the first to study 
derived versions of uh, of Levine and model such as like Fordism. And I'm going to use their so-called SNC relations. Okay. So we suppose now that uh, V to X is projective and V and, and V to Y is quasi smooth of relative dimension minus time. So it represents some cycle in, in here. Sure. Then we have some W, which doesn't have anything to do with, uh, with X or Y. And okay, don't worry if you don't quite get it now. I'm going to show a picture soon. Uh, okay. Uh, we have that the restriction of this, uh, this bundle to V is supposed to be trivial and maps to Y from A to B are, are quasi smooth. And then we have this, basically the same relation again. Okay, so let's look at the picture. So this was our V. We assume that this first map here is projective the composition is quasi smooth of relative dimension minus i. Okay, so far everything is good. Uh, now we basically want to somehow break this into pieces. And we are saying that every time you can find a w, so this is this is, the thing here is w, uh, it doesn't have to do anything with x or y, there's no map to them or anything like this. I'm just saying that we have found w and v sits inside W as the virtual Cartier divisors. And moreover, it's the sum of two virtual Cartier divisors, A and B, okay? So in this situation, we, we can actually just take A from V and map it to Y. So that should be quasi smooth and B map it to Y. So we break this into like these two pieces and we assume that the pieces themselves actually also map to map quasi smoothly to y. Okay. Uh, and in this case, sorry. And in this case, we do have this this kind of relation, the same relation we had before. Okay. Oh yeah, sorry. I'm. Uh, yeah. One extra condition we have to enforce is that the normal bundle the virtual normal bundle of this embedding should be trivial. Uh, this is basically what's said here. Said here. Uh, yeah, otherwise you should use a more complicated formula, but this one I claim is sufficiently nice. Uh, okay, so maybe this looks a bit weird, but what is the point? The point is that we want to somehow break more cycles into pieces. Uh, the tools we, the relations we had before were actually not enough. So we need to add this extra relation. So what we really, really want would be to say that every time I have a derived scheme uh, and I can split it somehow into many components and if these components map to Y, the quasi smoothly then I can express uh, the whole cycle as somehow stuff some of, uh, of these pieces and maybe their intersections and, and, and stuff on them and so on. But it's very hard. Uh, I don't know how to define, uh, say, what is an irreducible component of a derived scheme. I mean, even for classical schemes, it's not super easy if you want to have the right scheme structure. Um, you should do something, something like that in the right algebraic geometry, I guess. Okay. But the point is that this is a special case where, uh, where it's easy to see what are the somehow the components. And that's and, and I claim that this is actually enough for, for many purposes. Maybe it's not the last one, who knows? But yeah, okay. And indeed, once you enforce all of these extra relations we obtain this thing, uh, which for the purposes of this talk, I'm just gonna call it bivariant algebraic cohortism. Maybe it's not the right one, but uh, I hope it is. Uh, and actually there's some nice properties about this that we'll find soon enough. Okay, so now we know one of the main players in the bivariant converse Floyd. Theorem. Well, it's not a theorem. 
yet, and maybe it never will be, but hopefully someday. And the other player is bivariant algebraic scale theory. And as I already told you, it was defined by Fulton and McPherson. Okay, so K0 of X embeds to Y is the graphetic group of hyperfit complexes. Uh, and for the special case of closed embedding, it's easy to say. Uh, so you take F in quasi coherent sheets on X. So you really should think of complexes uh, if X is classical. Uh, okay. And we are going to assume that uh, the cohomologies or the homotopy sheaves of, of those complex or object uh, are coherent sheaves on the truncation. So they're just coherent in, in classical sense. Okay. All of them, or so almost all of them are zero. So only finitely many of them are non zero. Okay. So this is basically saying that they should be in somehow DP code of, of X uh, bounded to right category, infinity categorical version of that one. Okay, but then there's one more condition, which is just saying that the push forward to Y should be perfect. So after you push forward to Y, you get a perfect complex. So for example, if, if, uh, if Y is smooth, uh, then this, these two conditions actually also imply the third one. But if Y is, has some similarities, then that's not the case. Necessarily. And okay, graphic group with uh, relate into what? So addition corresponds to cofiber sequences, or if you like, distinguished triangles. Okay. So, okay, let's just uh, give the main strategy of the proof. So oh, hold on, there is a there is a question, but. Uh... There are several questions. Uh, oh. <laughs> go to the previous slide, so perhaps you want to go to the. Uh, okay. Yeah, and they're uh, asking, there is whether there is relation between the upper eye and the lower eye, which I think the answer is probably no, but just. Uh, yeah, no, but it's just yeah. I should use J here. Yeah, it's not correct. Sorry about that. And okay, yeah. and the other is what is the truncation? What is tau zero? Oh, truncation of the right scheme. So okay. So if every time you have a, the right scheme, then you have an underlying classical scheme. Uh, so this corresponds to, I mean, a divide scheme is locally modeled by spectra of uh, simply short commutative rings. And then the truncation, you just take the rings of that component and those two together to give you a classical scheme. So in particular, if, if X was already classical scheme, then the truncation is just X itself. And if X is derived, then it's different. I hope this answers the question. Okay. So the strategy is that, okay, I'm basically just uh, saying, saying the same thing again and again, we have this obvious fourth thing, the cycle is mapped to the class of the push forward of the structure sheaf on, on B. And we just want to find an inverse to this fourth thing. Uh, one way of doing this is to construct somehow localized churn classes. So every time you have an I perfect complex, so X to Y is I, then you get this kind of a churn class of the complex. And these churn classes should satisfy at least that it respects addition. So every time you have a cofiber sequence uh, of, of I perfect complexes, then the first churn classes satisfy this kind of additivity. Okay, so this is at least one thing that we, we need. And what makes this hard is that, well, so first. First of all, churn classes of vector bundles are fairly easy because everything in the end boils down to vanishing low side sections. Uh, but it's it's not at all clear what should be done if you're given a complex. 
So for example, note that uh, if f is i perfect, then i f, uh, sorry, i lower star f has a finite resolution by vector bundle. Okay. And then on the cobordism ring of y, or even just the universal cobordism ring of i, I can take, or, or this, we have this kind of formula for the first churn class of f. But this is not good enough. These churn, churn classes of, uh, of, each, of these vector bundles, these first churn classes, have no reason to lift to this bivariant group. And in fact, they will not. I mean, because first churn classes are somehow codimension one. Maybe this embedding has higher codimension, so you don't have any hope of uh, factoring each of them separately. So somehow you have to construct the class like once. It has to be done once, basically. I'm an, and I'm claiming that I can do this when I have a complex of length two. So I just have a morphism of vector bundles of rank R, both have rank R, and I'm gonna use the generously low side to construct uh, these churn classes in, in CK lower upper star. Uh, this is the connected K theory, which I'm gonna explain next. So we consider this polynomial ring. Uh, so you just have this variable beta, and then this has the following formal group law, X plus Y minus beta X1, okay? And then this is really a definition, or this sort of uh, generalizes the definition of Levin and Morel, I think. Uh, that once you tensor your algebraic cobordism with this kind of thing, you get something that you say is connected K theory. And in fact, uh, constructing these localized churn classes for this connected K theory is enough for all the applications we are, or the main applications we are interested in, which is first of all the bivariant Connor Floyd and second of all uh, bivariant version of prothetic Free Monroe. And this is somehow because CK somehow interpolates between Chow and, and K theory. Uh, Tony, yeah. Yeah? may I ask you to show the previous slide at some point yeah. because you, you passed quickly through it? Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, uh -huh. okay, so cone here is just if these are vector bundles in a classical scheme, then cone uh -huh. is just uh, the length, two length complex. So you take this as a complex, basically. Uh, for the right schemes, it's not quite so simple, but it's also very not very hard. And this is the vanishing of the determinant, the derived vanishing locus of the determinant of, of this morphism. Okay, thank you. So I'm, I'm trying to construct the uh, churn classes that somehow are supported in the vanishing locus of the determinant. Okay, and I'm claiming I can do this using degeneracy loci, except I can't because they are not very good. We have to use degeneracy schemes. So what are they? Uh, so every time, again, we just have a morphism of vector bundles. R here is just the rank again. Uh, it's not some direct sum or product. Uh, but then we can take the projective space on E or the projective bundle of, on E and we have this kind of uh, morphism. So O minus one to E is the tautological, tautological uh, bundle. So it injects actually to E and then we compose with F to get this composition. And we de define the degeneracy scheme uh, of this morphism as the vanishing locus of this composition on, on here. Okay, fair enough. Uh, and this is somehow the universal scheme or universal derived scheme over Y where we can find a line bundle inside E that's killed by this F. So we have found somehow a line bundle in the kernel, if you like. Uh, another way to think about this is like a projective space on, on the fiber, uh, but this is not very useful way of thinking about it actually, okay. So the nice thing about this is that, oh yeah, and this factors, this morphism here actually factors naturally into this vanishing locus of the determinant. Uh, because if you found something in the kernel, so 
it, it, it cannot the uh, determinant cannot be non-zero. You you have a line bundle in the kernel. Okay. So yeah. So we are going to use classes of these uh, in in this. Uh, okay. I, I think I'll maybe takes like five minutes more. Uh, I'm sorry about this. Uh, okay. But this anti-tautological bundle restricts from PE to this degeneracy scheme. Okay. And then it's a theorem of uh, these guys, Hudson, Ikeda, Matsumura, Maruse. Uh, well, they don't really say this, but I've translated the result into a form, which is useful for, for this talk, which is the same that we take the term classes of this pathological bundle on here. Uh, we take them to the po some power and then push forward to Y. And then these have some nice formula, okay, in terms of term classes of the call. And then we use our sort of high school math skills to just invert this. Uh, you get some, something like this. And in particular, for the first term class of the cone, you have an extremely simple formula. So you just have this. Of course, this is the geometric power derivative. Okay. And then, then we recall that the, this degeneracy scheme actually factors through the vanishing orbits of the determinant. Okay. And then <laughs> I guess this is the old French tr trick. We turn the previous uh, result into a definition. So we just define the Kate localized term class as this kind of push forward. We use a slightly different push forward uh, because we want to end up in, in this bivariant group here, uh, not in what in the cohomogeneous of, of y, but yeah, you have some cycles that are on here, and then when you push forward, you take into account that they actually factor to the vanishing of the determinant. Fair enough. Okay, uh, since I'm running out of time, uh, let's go here. Uh, okay, so we want to show. So suppose we have this kind of diagram. So we have a couple of morphisms uh, and everything is like morphism of line bundles or sums of them. And we, we have just defined what are the localized first term classes or localized cave term classes. But now we want to show that they satisfy this kind of additivity formula. So the first localized term class of this is the sum of the first term class of this and first localized term class of this, okay? And yeah, uh, so that's, I hope this is a clear goal. Uh, and in fact, it's sort of easy to reduce this kind of case. Or you can always reduce uh, like uh, this more general kind of situation into basically case where you have just bunch of line bundles and their sums and morphism, sums of morphisms between them. Uh, okay. So in order to prove this kind of additivity, we recall that on, on P, on the projective bundle of, of the source, uh, we take the vanishing locus of this thing. This by definition is the degeneracy scheme. Uh, and in fact, because this uh, this is M1 plus, okay, it should be M1 plus M2, of course. Uh, okay, but then the vanishing locus of this is basically the vanishing locus of this part. And then you take the derived intersection with vanishing locus of S2. And if you look at it pictorial, pictorially, because S1 is just composition of I1 and Psi1, uh, actually the, the vanishing locus is just the sum of those two divisors. And similarly for S2. So as you can see, this is the fiber direction, this is the direction of Y. And because this is an I injection, the vanishing loci of I1 and I2 do not meet, but the vanishing locus of uh, Psi1 and Psi2 can meet. Unfortunately, I cannot draw a, a three-dimensional uh, picture. I'm not saying that these vanishing loci are, are the same. They, I'm just saying that they can intersect, okay? And, 
And because in the end, you are interested in the intersection of these things, okay? So these boxes are P, are these projective bundles, okay? You take their intersection and then that's the degeneracy scheme and it's gonna look like this. It has three components. And now we can use these extra relations we had, we added uh, in order to break basically the fundamental cycle of this one into pieces. And then we, we do, it, do it here. Uh, and okay, so, so the push forward of this class is, is by definition almost uh, the first churn class, the first localized churn class. Uh, I have to sort of make minor modifications in order not to lie, uh, but this still pushes forward to the first churn class. You take the decomposition given by sort of this kind of picture, and it's then straightforward to compute this kind of, uh, uh, that this additivity holds. I'm not able to give details because I'm already sort of over time. Uh, yeah, and generalizing to higher ranks is, is super easy. Uh, the picture just is not as simple, it's uh, higher dimensional, uh, but the combinatorics is, is trivial, okay? Uh, it's not clear how, okay, so the problem I have right now is it's not clear how to generalize this uh, to... Tony, could we... Okay. okay, we can stop here if you want. No, okay. you, you can conclude, but... Okay. <laughs> the conclusion. Yeah, uh, wait, you have a question or... Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll just conclude. So it's not uh, clear how to... Wait, which direction am I going? Okay, not clear what happens what should be done for general complexes. So suppose we have this kind of longer complex of vector bundles. And uh, yeah, maybe it's somehow possible to factor them uh, into shorter ones and just use this previous construction for this part. Uh, but yeah, this seems unlikely. Uh, and if this cannot be done, then what should replace the degeneracy schemes for longer complexes? And yeah, thank you and sorry for going over time. So there's some literature. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much for your talk. Uh, let, let, I'm going to ask if there are questions, but first there is a question in the chat that's asking whether you need resolution of singularities. Uh, no. I mean, yeah. You don't have re resolution of singularities unless you have a field of characteristic zero and I'm not working on them, so I, I cannot need it. So no, for all of my theorems, I can prove them without uh, resolution. Very good. Uh, so other questions? Yeah, I, I have a question. Um, could you go back to the slide where you define the term classes? Uh, the localized ones? Yes. So like you say that you have to take to do to invert some uh, like to do some I squared math. I, I was wondering if it was like uh, the way Fulton defines churn classes is by inverting the Segre power series basically, which is oh, I was wondering if it's something analogous to that or yeah, yeah. So okay, wait. Okay, maybe it's here. So basically the push forwards here are, or let's see, sorry, I'll have to write, find the right uh, slide. Yeah, so basically this one here is the kth segre class of, yeah. of, of the morphism. Yes. And somehow it can be solved in terms of the churn classes of the com of the of the complex, but it's not as simple as for mm -hmm. child groups because the formal group law is more complicated. Yes. So instead, you have this kind of formula. Yes. And then you invert this formula, and it gives you uh, a formula for for churn classes in terms of these segregate classes. Mm -hmm. 
So the idea is the same, the details are slightly different. Okay. Do you ha have you thought about doing the same for other formal group laws? Or? Yeah, I mean, so obviously the nicest thing would be to do this for algebraic comparison, but mm -hmm. unfortunately the formal group law is uh, complicated. Mm -hmm. So, uh, well, I think. Well, but there are things in between. I mean, the, the yeah, that, that's true. Uh, yeah, I haven't really thought about okay. other theories except algebraic comparison and connected K theory. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. I have a stupid question about bivariant theories. Sure. Um, is it obvious one way or the other that if you know that two bivariant theories agree, say, on identity maps or on projections to a point or inclusions of a point, then you know that the theories themselves agree more generally? Uh, no. So for example, you have... Uh operational bivariant theories, say the operational uh, bivariant Chow theory, uh, defined by Fu in Fulton's book uh, in the chapter about bivariant intersection theory. And I can define a bivariant intersection theory and this in characteristic zero. Uh, and actually I can show that these agree on projections to the point because then they just recover uh, child groups, but in general, they are different. Uh, and it's not clear when they should be the same. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Okay, are there any, is there any other question? Oh, I have a question. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, yes. uh, yeah. It seems that uh, by tensoring with some uh, uh, group law, you, uh, formal group law, you can uh, define some uh, child theory of uh, derived schemes. This is true. Yeah. Uh, does your uh, like functoriality properties recover the classical um, excessive intersection formula for child groups for child rings? Uh, yeah, it should. Uh, it should follow somehow from some geometric argument about the right schemes. I mean, if you're meaning that I have to say regular embeddings that don't intersect uh, transversely. Right. Uh, but still, their intersection is still a regular embedding. Then it, in this case, uh, you can, the homotopy intersections, it's still inside. Yeah. And it, it should be the derived vanishing locus of the zero section of the sort of excessive normal uh, bundle, I think, mm -hmm. something like this. And then, then so once you pull back uh, th this one, it, it's basically the same as taking the top term class of that bundle. I think the key is unique. Uh, well, yeah, the flat metric is unique as well. Cancel that comment. I have one minute to tell you the, the theorem, oh. which I should at least do. <laughs> uh, <laughs> which uh, is, this, this is uh, so I have question. this space of point. I mean, I muted. Uh, oh, okay. I <laughs> don't know what was going on. <laughs> so, okay, so, uh, okay, I, I understand. Okay, thanks. Yeah, thanks for the question. Mm -hmm, yeah. What if someone uh, is being shot in a minute? Oh, sorry. sorry. No, I'm just worried for this person who has one minute to tell the theorem. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> the person has one minute to live or something. You know? <laughs> okay, sorry. I can I ask about uh, the last question? Uh, but uh, do we have a comparison with the uh, cross child group? Yes. Uh, Integrally? So every time you have, uh, you can construct uh, virtual pullbacks for for uh, child groups. Yeah. Uh, you can define a morphism from derived algebraic uh, bordism, so the homology theory, to mm -hmm. those things, and it factors to this trans tensoring with uh, 
ZA for formal reasons because the formal group law in, in Chao is additive. Uh, I see, I see. The, the cohomology theory doesn't map in general mm -hmm. to Chao groups, uh, but if uh, X is LCI or quasi smooth, then it does. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, are there any other, is there any other question? No? Okay, so let's thank the speaker again. <laughs>